I want to know about it. So, but with uh, tonight, uh, the study for tonight is titled "From Nakedness to Righteousness, Clothed in the Glory of Christ," and I hope you enjoy hearing it as much as I enjoy preparing it. Um, this past Sunday, I brought a message to you guys from Ephesians chapter four, seventeen to thirty-two. We've been in the book of Ephesians. We're moving towards, we've got about a month left before we finish that series. But um, with the, the message this last Sunday, the title of the, of the message was The Divine Wardrobe. And if you remember, we focused on verses 22 to 24. And the passage reads, and this is in Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to, be, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And that was a central passage that we looked at where Paul was saying, don't walk as the Gentiles do. They're, they're, they're in darkness. They're in ignorance. They're alienated from God. But that is not the way you learn Christ. And then the central passage says, this is the way in which we should go. And of course, the language that Paul uses here is one of taking off and putting on clothing. There's this idea of putting on Christ as a form of a garment and taking off the old. And the first thing we need to ask is, why does Paul use this imagery of putting on Christ? Because without context, really, if you think about it, it seems kind of an odd thing to say. I mean, why not say, pursue the ways of Christ? Or... Uh, I don't know, endeavor to walk like Christ. Why does he use the word of putting on Christ and taking off the old as if it's a garment? And this idea of divine clothing or putting on Christ, I want you to know that it is not a random thought or an independent thought that Paul just pulled out of a hat. It's not like Paul was thinking there one day, thought, you know what, this is a nice image. This is a nice illustration. Let, let me add it to my, to my letters. No, there's actually a deeper, richer connection to the rest of Scripture. When Paul uses this language, uh, I can guarantee you that Paul knew that he was connecting to a thought, a strand that stretches throughout the Scriptures. And, and Paul is connecting that thought to Jesus. But to understand it, we have to go all the way back to Eden, and specifically Genesis 3. Uh, yes, next slide. Thank you, brother. So... When God first made Adam and Eve, he made them in the Imago Dei. Does anybody know what that phrase means except you? What does the Imago Dei mean? When God made humanity, he made them in the Imago Dei. In the image of God. Imago Dei, the image of God. So if they were made in the image of God, that's how he, especially when we look at Adam and Eve, when they first began, when they were first created, they were clothed in glory and righteousness because they were made in the image of God. And God is clothed in glory and righteousness. So they were walking intimately with God. So when, when Adam and Eve first were created, they were in a perfect uh, communion and relationship with God. Would, would everybody agree with that? Yes. And then something went wrong, right? So a lot of people don't understand this. And I've got to make this point so you understand later. When God placed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden, and he instructed Adam, when we read in chapter 2, verses uh, 16 to 17, let me re refresh your minds here. From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. A lot of atheists, a lot of non-believers criticize God here, and they say two things. Well, what a cruel thing to do. You put this nice, beautiful garden, everything's great. You can have anything you want, but don't touch that right there. He says it's almost like God was tempting Adam and Eve. That's the first criticism. The second thing is, uh, think about what God is saying. This is the other thing they'll say. God doesn't want humanity to, be, to have, to possess the knowledge of good and evil. And I saw a show, and I kid you not, I'm not making this up. It was a petition... Uh, it was a show that wanted to suggest that perhaps the, the history of Satan, because it was kind of a, a history of evil wickedness and how we've seen it and uh, satanic rituals and all this stuff. And they said, maybe we've got it wrong. And there was a, 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 a supposed scholar that came out on TV and said, you know, maybe we got it all wrong. Think about it. 
It was God that was holding humanity back. God that didn't want them to have the knowledge of good and evil. And maybe, maybe Satan's gotten a bad rap. After all, he just wanted them to, to grow in their knowledge and understanding. He wanted them to be free and to understand more and to have more knowledge. Now, if that's not demonic warfare, if that's not blatant, this is on, on a national television series and somebody petitioning for that. And if, that, if you don't have eyes to see that, and more importantly, if you don't have an answer to that, when somebody challenges the notion that God is holding humanity back here, we're in trouble. But I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that this tree provided knowledge of both good and evil. So did God not want Adam to know good? And the answer is no, that's not the case. That's not the point. The point is, it's not that God didn't want Adam to know good or evil. He just wanted him to know God. You understand the difference there? You see, he's like, Adam, if, if you just walk with me, you don't need to worry about knowledge of good or evil. If you know me, you have everything that you need to know. In other words, I am all sufficient for you. You don't need to pursue anything else. I'm all encompassing. I'm sufficient for your life. So, so he is for, for us as well. So we have to understand this before we go into the Eden and the nakedness of Adam and Eve. So now let's read the fall again. Go to Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 to 13. And I want to read the fall again here about what happened. But I want you this time to pay attention, special attention, to the aspect of nakedness and clothing. All right? Whoever would like to read. Genesis 3, verses 6 to 13. <clears throat> so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And then they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Thank you. How interesting that the immediate consequence of this sin isn't that their hair falls out or that they go blind or that they get really sick or some animal comes up and starts biting them or something. No, the immediate consequence is nakedness. It's not lightning or thunder. It's not a whirlwind. It's not anything else. Think about that. The immediate consequence is they saw themselves and saw that they were naked. Is there a theological implication there? Absolutely. And you're going to really appreciate it by the time we get done with this study. They were already naked though. But they were already naked. So what changed? Awareness. Awareness, right? Knowledge of good and evil. And the word that we need to associate with the nakedness here, the theological idea here is shame. Their knowledge of good and evil, what happened is when they took of that the fruit, what opened up their eyes was that they had just messed up. Have you ever done something and right in the middle of it you went, ooh, this is really bad. This is a bad idea. I remember, um, y'all have heard the story about when, when um, have I told y'all the story about when I was in college and I had just gotten a radio, a stereo, and I was driving and I wasn't paying attention. This was when I was in college and um, I didn't see the, the intersection and I was sitting there messing with it, and I had a little remote on it and everything. And, and before I knew it, I had run the red light. And I just barely missed a big old semi coming across the intersection. Now, have I ever said, shared that with you? You just shared the story right now. Oh, okay. Well, now, yeah, I just did. I realized that I had messed up right in the middle of the intersection. It was too late now. I mean, it was. there's a feeling of panic and fear saying, I just messed up, and there's nothing I can do about it. That's probably how Adam and Eve felt. 
no, you surely will not die, but your eyes will be open, right? Well, yeah, well, you just opened up my eyes to realize that I just messed up. Think about the irony of that, right? So the consequence is shame. Notice chapter 2, verse 25 of Genesis. Why do I say that shame is the immediate connection to nakedness? So shame and their knowledge of good and evil, their sin produced shame. And that shame is likened and compared to or made equivalent to nakedness. Somebody read chapter 2 verse 25 of Genesis. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Say it again. The man and his wife were both naked and felt no shame. Why did they not feel shame at that moment? Because... They, they, they hadn't done anything wrong with God. They were, they were in that moment. They were sinless before God. So the nakedness here, their sin equals shame, which is depicted in their nakedness. And now their broken relationship with God. Does everybody follow on that? That's very important. Because now notice Genesis 3.21. Notice this chapter 3 verse 21. Notice how Adam and Eve tried to cover their nakedness and were incapable. Verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So who clothed Adam and Eve? God. Notice chapter 3, verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Their attempts to cover themselves were insufficient. In other words, humanity was not capable of covering themselves. Do you see a theological insight there? They were naked in their shame, but they were incapable of doing anything about it. And so who steps in but God and provides for them animal skins? It is God who clothes them and with animal skins. And that is very important, my friends, because it signals that sin has serious consequences. There would be two animals that would die as a result of that sin. Because he didn't just, uh, God didn't just pull animal skins off of a tree. There were two animals that died in order to cover Adam and Eve. You see that? Yeah. So, so not only does something die, the consequences of that sin, what's implied there is sin must be atoned for by blood. Which is what sets the whole foundation for the Old Testament, the animal sacrificial system, and what we see happen for the next 4,000 years, right? Leading up to Jesus. Um, so... Even though the skins cover them, though, it's a temporal fix. It's not a permanent solution. He provides for them the, the animal sin, skins, and just as the animal sacrifices would cover up the sins of humanity, it would still be insufficient to fully redeem them. Which is why Hebrews talks about how we used to do the animals, and everything, but it was insufficient. But now we have the perfect sacrifice in Christ. So the animal coverings could never also fully cover the nakedness of their shame. It's a temporal fix. And so now humanity begins its story. After the fall, here's where they are. They're naked in their shame. They've been temporarily clothed by God. The indication of the blood that now must be spent in order to atone for sin. And so humanity begins its fallen journey. And the Old Testament begins here to a thread, a theological thread on nakedness and clothing. And it gives us several glimpses of humanity's spiritual nakedness and their need for spiritual covering. And this is where it begins. Brother, go to the next slide. I want to show you real quick just a few so be, Yes. So does that does that kind of tell in the part of where it says for on the day that you eat of this tree you will surely die? What is that right there? Does Is that part of dying that they found the nakedness, the shame, and... Yes, because they died spiritually. So that's what it is. They're dying spiritually. They died spiritually. They're, they're, they're disconnected from God who is life. The source of eternal life has now been broken. And these two individuals, so had they not sinned, when what would, how long would they have lived if they had not sinned? For eternity. Now, we read Adam dies. We read Eve dies. And we read everybody else dies. And so will we die. Yeah. But those in Christ will rise again, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so the death that, that is instilled, and here's the, the terrible thing about it, Angelo. It's not limited to humanity. World, the world and creation itself suffers as a consequence of that sin. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, 
everything begins to decay, which is indicative because when Jesus comes and he heals the blind man and makes him able to see, it's a reversal of the effects of the fall. When somebody is, is dying and he raises them, it's a reversal of the death that was instilled. All of the miracles that Jesus is doing in his ministry is the indication of a re reversal of things. It's a glimpse. This is what it's like to walk with me. The things of the former are now reversed in the positive. I, my movement goes towards life. This world moves towards death and destruction and decay. So, so that's, a and that's a very important thing. Don't, don't forget that word reversal because I'll bring it back up. So here we see in the Old Testament numerous uh, biblical references to, uh, to clothing as a clue for how we stand before God. Go with me to Job 29 verse 14. And we're going to look at Job really quickly here. Just a couple of things. Job 29, 14. It's not Job, by the way. I had somebody one time say, yeah, you know how Job says like Job. Um, job, uh, job, Job 29, 14. See, I got myself. Job 29, 14. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. You know who's speaking there? Job. Job is, you know, you know the story. He's been, you know, the enemy has attacked him and taken everything from him. And, and he's bemoaning himself and wishes he had died. And his wife <coughs> wants him just to curse God and die. And he's covered in boils. He's lost his kids. He's lost his fortune. And he begins to petition, petition himself and say, I'm innocent before God. I don't deserve this. I haven't done anything. And there's this huge dialogue going. And he makes this declaration. Job says, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. And so in his appeal to God, he claims to have clothed himself with righteousness. But then in chapter 38, God <coughs> responds and puts him in his place. Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without wisdom? You brace yourself like a man, for now I'm going to answer you. And for the next like three chapters, God just pounds him with truth. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? You tell me, how do the stars get up there? How does the, the waters and this and that? And how do the animals... Are? And after three chapters of just pounding him and, putting, and giving him just huge slices of humble pie, Job finally realizes that he can't clothe himself with righteousness that he was boastful in a way that wasn't right before God. And I want you to notice Job chapter 40, verse 10. Somebody read for me Job chapter 40, verse 10. In response to Job's claim that he clothed himself with righteousness, notice what God responds to in chapter 40, verse 10. Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Let me, uh, I'm using the NASB, by the way, just in case. Uh, the Old Testament, man, the, the NASB, I'm telling you guys, um, that, that's to me the best. You know, of course, it's probably the closest to being the, the most literal. The uh, NASB is just fantastic when it comes to that. And I try not to get too bent on, I try to try to look at the original Greek as much as I can, especially when I prepare my messages. But... When God tells Job here, look at verse 9, for example. Or he's, there's, By the way, this is sarcasm. Or do you have an arm like God, and can you thunder with a voice like his? He's giving them this humble pie, right? Can you tell me, Job, you said you clothed yourself with righteousness? And so when God speaks to Job here in verse 10, he's, he's throwing some irony on here. Uh, not sorry, some uh, sarcasm here. All right, Job, adorn yourself. Since you clothe yourself with righteousness, adorn yourself with eminence and dignity and clothe yourself with honor and majesty. You show me. All right. Go ahead. You think you're, you're so righteous and innocent. Before me. <coughs> and what God is reminding Job here is that despite he, and he was a righteous man. He was a good and righteous man. But despite all his righteous deeds, they are nothing compared to the glory and the majesty of God. And Job, in chapter 42, verses 1 through 6, repents, and he pulls back in dust and ashes. He says, I will shut my mouth, for 
for I have seen the glory of the Lord, and I had no business opening my mouth. And he withdraws, and he humbles himself, and God blesses him and restores him. So the point I'm trying to make here is that in Job, we see this idea of clothing and righteousness, and God is making a very, very clear point. Even somebody as righteous as Job could not stand before God and declare himself righteous or adorn himself with any kind of self-righteousness. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, I want to spring down because you had mentioned the chapter 42 when, you know, he's like, oh, I'm sorry, you're right, Lord. At the very end, where he says, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that, that last portion there? Uh, th that, uh, the the, like, I know the, the ancient uh, Near Eastern form of, of mourning was, you know, people would rip their garment, which is another indication, but... Um, but they would, uh, they would pour dust and ashes on themselves. It was a way of, of, if you read back when, for example, when King David, when Bathsheba's baby dies as a result of his sin, Naaman, the prophet, tells him, as a result of what you've done, that baby's going to die. He goes and he appeals to the Lord and he, and he lays in dust and ashes. If you look at uh, Nineveh's response to Jonah's preaching, so uh, they'll put on sackcloth instead of comfortable garb, they'll put sackcloth on, which is like a really rough, uncomfortable garment. They would put it on themselves and then they would pour ashes on themselves. And basically what it is, it's a way of saying, I don't want to be comfortable. I don't want to look nice. I'm mourning. I want the outside to reflect how I feel. And so if you're mourning, you're repenting. You know, if somebody passed away, uh, somebody would go out and sit and they would pour ashes on themselves or they would put sackcloth. And it's says this is an outer indication of what's going on on the inside and it could be it could be um repentance and 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 uh sorrow it could be grieving so it's it's a it's um it, it's a phrase that indicates that that job is repentant for what he said he's he's um he he regrets having made such a claim to god and that's a great question so uh, let's let's go now to Genesis chapter 37. Go to Genesis 37, verse 3. Everybody knows the story of Joseph. Joseph, the son of Jacob. And by the way, we all know that Joseph is known as a type of Christ. A typology here. He's often compared, his life is compared to that of Christ. Well, his father Jacob gives him a gift. What do y'all remember is the gift? Yeah, so if you look at 37 verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a very colored tunic. See that? And I want you to remember tunic. Now some people, you know, some versions say coat. That's why I like the NASB. The NASB is pretty, sticks pretty close to it. And I think, and I love the fact that it says tunic. Remember that. What did he give him? A tunic. Don't forget that. And it says that he gave him a, a, this tunic of many colors, which is pasim. And this pasim is a, a hapax a legomenon, which means that it's one word used and it's not repeated again in the Old Testament. So people struggle. What exactly does, does this uh, pasim or pasim mean? But most people think that it was a well-adorned tunic. But his father gives him this gift, and his brothers despise it. They feel jealous because of it. And how interesting that their jealousy is largely based on this garment that is given to Joseph by his father. Of course, he gives a bad report on his brothers. Of course, he has the dream, and he, dream, that he dreams that they bow down before him, which is even more insulting. But there's already issues between him and his brothers. They see him as, as arrogant and cocky. Uh, and he, they feel like he's uh, favored by the father, which he probably was. But this garment plays a huge factor in here. Okay, so he's got this 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 uh, this tunic that's that's very beautiful, given by his father. And the brothers betray Joseph. And then in verses 31 to 34, if you go to 37, 31 to 34, they conspire to betray Joseph. And I want you to notice what happens to this tunic. So 37, starting in verse 31. So the brothers took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. 
And then they sent this very colored tunic, Pashim tunic, and brought it to their father and said, we found this, please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it and said, it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes, which was another sign of grief, and put sackcloth on his loins, see that? Yeah. And mourned for his son many days. So there's this grieving process, this mourning process. So how interesting that this garment, this tunic, plays a major role in the betrayal of Joseph, who is a type of Christ, and how it's dipped in blood and given to the father as some sort of evidence to show that the son is dead. Now, this is just, again, I don't want to go too far into this. Uh, you could develop a whole study just on that. What's my point? Why am I sharing this? Is because garments played a large, uh, um, a large part of many many of the narratives that are involved in the Old Testament, and this is one of them. Uh, questions or comments before we go to the next one? Psalm ninety three verse one. This is another Old Testament uh, example. Ninety three one, it delineates human garb with the clothing of God. Notice what it says in Psalm 93, verse 1. The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded himself with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Here again, it is showing that the majesty of God is clothed. We see this idea of clothing, right? And perhaps the most profound Old Testament voice regarding this spiritual garment is in Isaiah. So the Isaianic prophecies include this, and this is very important. In Isaiah 64, 6, I want you to listen to this. This is, a, this is to me, one of the most important texts. And somebody were to say, in regards to clothing and wearing, show me a verse that really describes the difference between the world before Jesus and the world after. And I would give them this verse. Isaiah proclaims, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. So our righteous deeds in the eyes of God are like filthy rags. Do you think that reference to the, the leaf withering away is an echo to... Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve clothing themselves with fig leaves. Hey, that is a I've never I never thought about that connection. Did you hear what Rudy <laughs> said there? Yeah. So here he's saying, he's saying, and all of us wither like a leaf. The very thing that the that Adam and Eve tried to clothe themselves with, which was something uh, uh, insufficient and, and temporal. Yeah, that's a wonderful connection there, brother. Thank you. But you notice not only are the best that we can offer is. It looks like a filthy garment in the presence of God. That's what God is trying to explain to Job. Job, you're, 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 you're a righteous man, yes, for you. But you have no business questioning me. Because if you start comparing yourself, your righteousness, to, to qualifying to stand before me and to be able to commune with me, you've got another thing coming. And here, again, Isaiah is making that a note. The best that we can do is nothing but a filthy garment. And why? Because of our iniquities. <laughs> why? Because of our iniquities. And then Isaiah prophesies, and, and you don't have to go there, in chapter 53, verses 4 to 5, that the Messiah will be crushed for our iniquities, and by his wounds we are healed. Amen. The very thing that makes our garments filthy rags, Isaiah prophesies that very thing, the iniquities, that's what the Messiah is going to take upon himself. I want you to remember that, okay? Okay. Now, I want you to notice 61.10, Isaiah 61.10. In this spirit, the Isaiahic prophecies that really point to the Messiah, notice what he says. He proclaims, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Did you know that if you really look at the language that we don't have time to die tonight to do it, but if you really look at the language of Isaiah in this section, 
you can tell that there's a differentiation between speaking of Yahweh God and then speaking of my Lord here and what he will do. And many scholars believe that he's differentiating between God the Father and the Messiah who is God the Son. But when you see he has clothed me in, uh, with garments of salvation, wrapped me with the robe of righteousness, and then he describes him as a bridegroom. Does that sound familiar? Where have you heard that? Don't answer. Where have you heard bridegroom? Come on. In the Old Testament, when Jesus talks about the church, it means, well, that's the bride. Okay, in Revelation, it talks about the bride and the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. But where is the bridegroom? Okay, you can answer now. The bridegroom. Who says, no, 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 it's fitting that this happens because I'm just a friend of the bridegroom. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. So John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, he's the bridegroom. Yeah, but he's, he's uh, uh, baptizing. He's taking our spot. That was our spot. It's got the nice shade right there. It was real comfortable. We would have picnics under the table. Jesus is there on this side. It's, he must increase and I must decrease. Amen. I'm just a friend of the bridegroom. That's the bridegroom. See? So what, when we see the Old Testament setting the stage, it includes this language of righteous garb. The, the Messiah will provide a clothing of righteousness. He will, we will be clothed in his salvation. And then came Jesus. Go to the next slide, brother. Go with me, please, to Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 30. This was a, a really fun slide to make, by the way. I was actually sad when I finished it. You ever have fun with something and you're like, man, I don't want to. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 30. I want you to keep this idea, this mentality about garb and, and, and clothing and righteousness. <coughs> then came Jesus and he begins to speak to us. And he shares... How we should not worry. And again, I'm reading from the NASB. Matthew 6, 25 to 30. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. It is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, <clears throat> and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth more, much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow, and they do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So, when you really look at it from the aspect of spiritual garb and the clothing of righteousness, in many ways you could make a case that Jesus is speaking on a much deeper level than simply reducing our worry. If you really think about it, I think that Jesus is reminding us that if we place our faith in God, that God will clothe us in more ways than one. Why are you worried about clothing? God is going to clothe you in a way that you, you wouldn't even imagine. I think that there could be a, a, a case made here that when Jesus uses the language of clothing, just like he would say, well, what about the eating? Well, I don't know. Man was not made for bread alone, right? But on the words of God. Why not? It parallels that. The idea that the clothing could be spoken of in more than just a temporal worldly sense. That's why he's saying don't worry about those things. And notice verse 33 of Matthew chapter 6. If we seek first his kingdom... And his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. Pause. All these things. All what things? The things that I just told you. If you seek first my kingdom, these things, the clothing, the food, the provision, the provision of God will, will, will come. Don't worry about that. So it's the totality of what's been promised. And that's why Jesus chastises the church at Laodicea in Revelation 3, 17 to 18. And uh, i got to give credit to Rudy, by the way, because when all of this came to mind, I always like to call him and bug him. He calls me and bugs me, so it's okay. And uh, we were kind of going through this and talking about it, and i got to give him credit because he's like, hey, think about 
uh, the church at Laodicea and so forth. Uh, and we were talking about it. This is a church that had become distracted with worldly security. And I want to read to you what he tells this church. Again, stay in the mentality of clothing. When he speaks to them in Revelation 3, 17 to 18, he says to them in Laodicea, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness, there's that word, shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I self to anoint your eyes so that you may see. So what you see here is an indication that people who are not walking with God are walking in all the fullness of their shame and humiliation. They're living shamefully and their shame is exposed before God. And so what he's saying to this church is, you're not walking right with me. I am not the cornerstone of your church. You're lost and you're lost in the world and you're relying on all this. Uh, it, it must have been one of those churches like the modern church today. You walk in, it's a beautiful building. They got all the fancy stuff and it looks great. And Jesus is saying, there's none of that's going to help you. All of that is nothing but pathetic, um, temporal things that has no standing or worth before me. And so here he uses this language of their nakedness again. So we also see it in the parable of the marriage feast. And we're not going to go there. But in Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14, Jesus gives a parable of the marriage feast. The people didn't come when they were invited. So they went out, hey, go just invite everybody. And they go and they have the feast. But there's one guy that doesn't belong. The king sees that person and notices what? That they're not dressed appropriately. Hey, how did you get in? person had no response bind him get him out of here that person is kicked out you may say well what a mean king no that person was not dressed for the occasion and of course when he's talking about this feast he's talking about heaven not just anybody can get in you're gonna have to in order to get in you're gonna have to be clothed appropriately but lord i can't clothe myself no worries i got you i have a garment just for you if you belong to me there's going to be a coat waiting for you a, a garment of righteousness that's provided Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm about almost there. Okay. Actually, no. Almost there, yeah. All right. So. Hey, Irby, can I make a quick comment? Sure. Going back to Genesis where God uh, asks uh, Adam and Eve, you know, what they were up to. And uh, they realized they were naked and were ashamed. You notice that that the curse and the curse on, on the world, on Eve and on Adam, all happen immediately after that, and he doesn't clothe them until afterwards. So they're not clothed, and then he's going to tell them this is what's going to happen. It's in the context of that tremendous shame that they must have felt that he lays the boom down on them. Mm. Uh, I think there's there's something there. Yeah. For you to study and bring a study on this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, that I love that. Uh, I was, I was telling Rudy that I'm, I'm going to be working up a, a, an article on this. By the way, I'm going to. I told him this is my journal article Rudy, to work on. So that's not an article. I can see it already. That's a book. I ain't got time for a book. Don't encourage him. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, how about you and I write it together? You and me, and uh, we'll bring in a couple of others to write chapters. Okay, there you go. Because this is this. this is majestic, isn't it? Yeah. So. When we look at the other, and of course, I wanted to focus on, on Jesus' words in Matthew 6. And I already shared with you Ephesians 4, to lay aside the old and put on the new. And Paul repeats this idea in Romans 13, 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. And Galatians 3, 27, where he says, For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So those are repeating themes that Paul uh, uh, echoes. So now you can see that when Paul uses this reference to putting on Christ and the, and the clothing yourself with Christ, he was going back to a long biblical tradition that stretches back as far as Genesis. But it gets even better. It gets even better. Go with me now to John chapter 19, verses 23 to 24. John chapter 19, verses 23 to 24. 
In the crucifixion, the Gospels make numerous references to <coughs> Jesus' clothing. They make numerous uh, references to Jesus' clothing, and this is no coincidence. You know what the typical Jewish garb was? Six items. And that's important. I'll tell you why in a little bit. There were six items. Number one, a loincloth, which was the underwear. The loin. Loincloth. Number two was the undergarment. That was the tunic. The tunic touched the flesh. It was called the ketone. And it was uh, the undergarment that went underneath. That was the tunic that they took from Joseph. Uh, and, of course, uh, the, the tunic that, of course, Jesus wears as so well. It's, a, it's like our T-shirts. Yeah, but a long T-shirt. It's like really long. And then there's the outer garment on top of that. And then there's a belt, usually, which is usually, you know, leather or cloth. And then there's a head covering. It's the Jewish talit, and it had tassels on the end. So it's not like a hat. It was almost like a long scarf with little, um, uh, with little tassels on the ends. The same head covering that you, they would wear it, and then whenever they needed to, they would. And back then, it would get windy, dusty, and everything. They would put it on sometimes to cover their heads when they're out in the sun, when they're walking. So it was almost like a long scarf, but it had those tassels. Same tassels that the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years stretched out and said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. So, and the sixth thing that they wore was the sandals. So there were six things that Jewish people wore. And you'll know in a little bit why I mentioned this. So when they flogged Jesus in, in John chapter 19, verse 1, they would have removed the clothing. He would have had to remove the clothing when they flogged him. And then afterwards, something very interesting happens. We read in Matthew 27, verses 27 to 31, that Jesus is stripped and he's dressed and mocked as a king by the Romans. They put this, this uh, uh, purple robe on him. They put the crown of thorns and all these things. And these Romans get in front of him and they mock him as a king. And they're making fun of him. But before he is led out to his crucifixion, we read in verse 31 of Matthew 27, that they put his own clothes back on him. They put his own clothes back on him again. And that's very important. Because when Jesus goes to the cross, he's wearing his own garments again. He's wearing his own garments. Don't forget that. Now, let's read John chapter 19, verses 23 to 24. Whoever would like to read that. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts. A part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Hmm. So when Jesus arrives at Golgotha, before he is crucified, his garments are stripped from him. They're taken from him. His garments are taken from him. And they're <coughs> divided amongst four Roman soldiers. So we know that there were four Roman soldiers assigned there. So we know that there's four articles of clothing that are taken, plus the tunic. So that's a total of how many? Five. Four articles of clothing, one for each of the soldiers, and the tunic. How many total pieces of clothing did a Jewish man wear? Six. So people have asked, was Jesus completely naked on the cross? Concerning the fact that the Jews abhorred public nudity, not that the Romans really would have cared what the Jews thought, but uh, there's every indication that he, he would have probably have been crucified with his loin cloth on. Now, that's debatable, but that's neither here nor there. But just so you might know, people have asked that question. Was he completely naked? Some people make a, a case for it. But seeing as how the standard Jewish garb was six pieces, and you have four pieces of take, uh, 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 clothing taken, and then they cast lots for the tunic, you leave one article left. And that would have probably have been the loincloth or the underwear. Um, but why did they strip them? It was part of the humiliation. The shame. The shame. The shame. Why do you think I'm making that point? What is nakedness equal to? Shame. shame. He took upon the shame our shame. Him. Our shame. You see the imagery? <laughs> and it gets better. They didn't just throw away, I mean, it probably would have been bloody and dirty, but they didn't throw away the clothes. Nor did Bob, the Roman soldier over here, take it on and just take off. They, they dispersed it amongst each other. Each soldier got a portion, and then they cast lots to see who would get the tunic. Who, who was given a multicolored tunic? Joseph. Hmm. Okay, so 
tunic, right? Notice that in the same way that Jesus freely offers his body as a sacrifice on the cross, here, John is now noting that his garments are included in that sacrifice. His shame is indicative of his nakedness, the nakedness that belongs to us, and the clothing is an offering. Now, I'm not making it parallel to the bodily sacrifice. That's a real bodily sacrifice. What I'm saying is, is that John is offering us here a theological statement. He's making a statement here. Like the King of the Jews statement on the top of the cross. Remember, Rome at that time was the world. And when Pontius Pilate says, no, you put it on top, Jesus, King of the Jews. And the Jews protested, no, no, just say that he said, no, what I said, I've said. And they put that on there. What God ensures is that when his son is dying on that cross, that it's declared to the world, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. In the same way here, as his garments are taken from him and it's dispersed amongst humanity, it's an image. Jesus is now being stripped and he's now taking on the nakedness, shame for humanity, as well as his garbs are being dispersed amongst the world. See that? It gets better. I want you to notice there at verse 24, the prophetic significance. He, he, uh, John connects it. This isn't an opinion. John connects it. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it. Of course, the tunic. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This is the Psalm of David, chapter 22, verse 18. The same psalm where Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Coincidence? Same song that's connected to the casting of lots for taking his clothing and being cast. I don't think so. Um, why does John make note of this connection in Psalm 22? Because the clothing that Jesus offers is part of the sacrifice that represents our justification. It's part of that imagery that John connects to. And the main point is this. When Jesus is stripped of his garments at the crucifixion and it's dispersed amongst the Romans who are representative of the world, the spiritual nakedness of Eden has now been reversed. Just as Jesus, when he cured illness, he was reversing the effects of death. Just as uh, the, the speaking of tongues at Pentecost was a reversal of the confusion of tongues in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel or Babel. Here now, the reversal of this nakedness and the shame has now been reversed because of what Jesus did there in the stripping of the garments and being dispersed is now indicative of the reversal of that. Now, humanity will no longer live in shame and nakedness before God. Amen. 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 Right? And it gets better. We'll wait this morning. <laughs> by, by his sacrifice, we're now clothed not in animal skins, but in righteousness. And it finds its ultimate fulfillment in Revelation chapter 19. Go with me there. Sister, since you brought it up, will you read verses 7 through 9, please, ma'am? Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. It says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the, righteousness act, is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Amen. Let me tell you why it's so important to understand what's being said here. Were, were we saved, were we shown grace, were we saved by grace so that we could wallow and, and, and grow fat in our, in our own salvation? No. Because Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 completes the thought that we were not only saved by grace, but we were created for good works. Good works. Here, that theme is reinforced. God didn't clothe us in righteousness so we could walk around and prance around like proud peacocks all day. So that we could look at the world and, and, and toad ourselves and say, look how, how nice I look compared to you. Look how, how pretty my, my righteous garments are compared to you. That's not the point. 
What's the purpose of the righteousness that God has clothed us with? The righteous acts of the saints is what this uh, idea of fine linen stands for. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. You, you are not just being uh, clothed in righteousness uh, to look nice and to be saved, but to use it for a purpose. When you go to Ephesians chapter 6, which follows Ephesians 4, Paul begins to talk about the armor of God. Right? Go to Ephesians chapter 6. It gets better. No, I'm just um, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. I do not know. If you disagree, it's okay. This isn't a, a, a make it or break it issue. If you disagree with me, that's okay. This is my opinion. When Paul begins to speak of the armor of God, I do not think that he's differentiating between the righteous garb, the righteousness that we are clothed with by God, and spiritual armor. It's not like, I don't believe that Paul is saying, well, you know, Jesus has clothed us in righteousness, which is, of course, our justification in the blood of Christ. I don't think that he's, he's saying, well, there's that, and then there's the armor of God. No, I believe that they're one and the same. In other words, the righteous garment of God in Christ, the what we're clothed in in Christ, is spiritually bulletproof. <laughs> It's not just some fancy little garb that will rip and tear if you get it hung up on a nail. I think that when he's describing the armor of God, there's two things you need to understand. The spiritual righteousness, the, the garb that we're clothed in, number one, is practical for today. We don't just wait until the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's practical for use today. It's necessary for today. And the second thing you need to understand is that it, it, it is a very real, functioning uh, article that we've been given, spiritual article, in order to navigate through this life and to do the good works of God and to fulfill our ministries. Notice uh, verse 10, chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of uh, this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. With this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. To me, this is the practical and effective <coughs> use of the garments that we've been given. Paul, in my opinion, is speaking of the same spiritual garb that God has given us as when we look at the righteousness of clothe yourself with the righteousness of Christ. But boy, does he, doesn't he define it in a different way? Because if I were to say, close your eyes and I want you to imagine uh, Jesus clothing you with his righteousness, you might think of a pretty nice little white robe. Right? A real pretty robe, and it's real soft. Don't tear it. It might get dirty. Don't eat spaghetti with it. it might get... No. The garb that Jesus covers us with is like a weapon of war against the spiritual forces of darkness. It's one that we can use, one that protects us, and one that makes us effective in our ministry. And that is why I think that when we look at how it's defined as the righteous acts of, uh, of the saints, we begin to realize this isn't just to make us look pretty. This is to be functioning and effective in our use. And to me, that's the most important thing to understand, what we're supposed to do with this. So. I was going to say, um, this is to function in the, wor in the, in the world after the fall. Yeah. Um, because before, they didn't need all that. They had that full-on protection. They didn't have to... You're referring to Adam and Eve. Yes, I'm sorry. My, I didn't mention that. Uh, to the, back to Genesis how now it's <coughs> now we have to do all this because there's sin before 
they didn't need to worry about that. You talked about how um, they 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 didn't need to wear, worry about the, the evil. It wasn't um, it wasn't even in thought. Mm-hmm. It was information that God just kept from them. Like you don't need you don't need to entertain that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so now, yeah. Questions, comments. Well, that would be, I mean, <clears throat> the, the saints on the parable of the <coughs> king when he invited everybody to the wedding and no one showed, and he went to get everybody, no matter who they are, and they come this guy that he said that he wasn't dressed properly for the wedding and day because he wasn't on the rushing of the spirit of the Lord. Not that he didn't have the clothes on the Lord. Like yeah. So the context, uh, the context of uh, the uh, invitation to the to the uh, to the to the celebration of the marriage, really reflects Revelation 19, the marriage supper, right? The invitation of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Here's the gospel, and, and says, no, I won't listen. I won't respond, right? So then, here's a person that at the end of days would maybe come before and says, Lord, 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 didn't I, didn't I? And what does Jesus say to them? Get away from me! I never knew you. They're not clothed in righteousness. And their righteous acts are not reflective. There's nothing for them. They're, they're, they came in filthy rags. Isaiah, right? right. And so, so the clothing, what we wear in the, in, in the presence of God, ultimately, will be defined not by what we do, but what we do in Christ. So, questions, comments, any others? That's, that's the summary, which, by the way, I can't believe I actually finished on time. And I know I gave you a lot of information here, but I find a beauty in this. I find a beautiful thread here going through scripture that reminds us that I I know what it's like to stand spiritually naked before the Lord. I mean, nothing to defend myself, nothing to justify myself. I I stand before him and nothing I could do except just repent and kind of like uh, like Job says, and uh, repent in and, and dust and ashes and say, Lord, I can only do, just bow my head before you and, and plead for mercy and for your grace. And the clothing that he gives us is one that allows us allows us to 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 be invited and to be a part of a community and to be a part of fellowship with God that we otherwise wouldn't have. We can't be in his presence without it. But the question I want to leave you with as we close is God has clothed you in righteousness. You're now in your righteousness clothed with the glory and the majesty of Christ because you've believed and you've accepted him. Well, what have you done with that? What have you done with that? Have you have, have Remember the, the, the marriage supper, that it's the righteous acts. Remember Ephesians 2.10, for we were created for good works. And well, the reason I say that is because evangelicals uh, make such a strong point, which rightfully so, of explaining that we are saved by grace alone. We can't make it a works-based salvation. But you can't forget, it's not just a cart without the horse or the horse without a cart. The horse that's driving this whole thing is, our, is that we're saved by grace. It's a gift that we didn't deserve. But that horse is pulling a cart. And the cart is the righteous acts. The cart is, is the deeds that we do. The cart is that we were created for good works. And so there's a bunch of people running around with a, the with a horse with no cart. What are you doing with your, with your garb? What are you doing with the, with, the, with the righteousness that God has bestowed upon you? I have a question. So is it okay for us to take the battle to them? Well, it depends on, you would have to define it because, for example, I wouldn't endorse, I see people who are going out and they're casting out demons. They're going out and, and you never see Jesus do that in his ministry. When he encounters them, he responds. So we... But he encountered the Pharisees and told them and put them in their place. Well, but, but they came to him. They confronted him. And so Jesus never went out picking on or looking for fights. And, and so we have to, and that's a really a great comment, a great question because... Because we have to be careful because a lot of times we see Christians going out and, and remember what, you know, we, we're separated from the world. What does light have to do with darkness? Uh, have nothing to do with stupid or foolish arguments. That's a proverb. Uh, so we have to be careful not to throw our pearls before swine and go looking for fights, but to do the good work. And if we're confronted with it, uh, Jesus will provide for us. The Spirit will equip us. But I've seen Christians make that mistake. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't go out into the corner and, and if you say, well, what if I go out to the corner and, I pre- and I'm proclaiming the gospel? Praise yeah. God. Yeah. May the Spirit be with you. Yeah. But I think that when people are hostile, when I would say hostile Christians, I would caution against that because I would say that that's, that's uh, counterproductive to the fundamental mission of the gospel. But 
Yeah, because even when, when Christ was talking to the Pharisees, he wasn't talking to them directly. He was using parables uh, so that, and, and they knew after hearing the parables that he was talking uh, about them. So there was that conviction <coughs> that he left with them. Uh, it wasn't a direct attack to them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I've seen, and, and, and this is a great way to finish the, the, the study because when we talk about, well, what are these righteous acts? Of what, you know, what, what is it that I should do? Um, if if people see our lives and and they say, I want what that person has, then I think that we're 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 on the right track. But when people are repulsed by the way we treat or act, um, then 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 we got to be careful. For example, we're we're called the salt of, of the earth. We're called the light of the world. But if I go and I shine a bright halogen light right in somebody's face that's been walking in the darkness for 20, 30 years. They're going to go blind. They can't. I mean, it's it's too heavy. Yeah. Uh, if I take a meal and I pour five pounds of salt into it and say, "Here you go, eat," uh, it's 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 knowing how to do so. That's why when we speak the truth, it always comes in the form of love. Speak the truth in love, and and you're good at it. I mean, you, I know that you've you've been able to do that with so many people in your life, but we got to be careful to to do that because if we if we embitter people, uh, and and one of the things that that apologetics teaches, of course, apologetics is the defense of the faith, is the goal is not to win an argument. The goal is to win people over for Christ. Amen. And I think when you do it that way, you're doing it in the flesh. You're really not doing it in the spirit. Your, your flesh is taking control, and it's your, your mouth and your words. Yes. Although you think maybe it's God, but yeah. God doesn't want that way. Amen. I mean, I think, I think we just, uh, we, we have to look at it that way because we're walking out. We're carrying. We're wearing the garments of Christ. We need to act according to those garments, as you could say. Any other questions, comments before we close? Well, okay. Uh, I hope that the study was a blessing to you. That you might consider uh, consider uh, the gospel and really the the, the sacrifice from that aspect. Uh, it's something that to me is beautiful. Uh, because it, it reveals even deeper truths about the, the, the gift that was given to us at the cross. So, Paul said right here in uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 15 and 16, he says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as a wise man, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Well, let's close in, in prayer, and then we will dismiss for the night. Lord, Father, thank you for the study and for all that was shared, for the, uh, for the wonders and the majesty of your word and how it reveals to us just how far, how wide, how deep is your love for us. And, Lord, we see here in the element of clothing that you have clothed us in righteousness and not just clothed us, but clothed us for a purpose, that we might produce fruit for you, that we might perform good works and that we might be who you created us to be so lord father thank you lord first and foremost for for the clothing us in righteousness in the image of your son for for delivering us lord father from from death and equipping us for the ministry and so lord i pray a blessing over each individual here lord father that you may remind us that you've equipped us to do the good work and now it's just time to put those muscles to work it's time to to uh, live out the calling you've called us to, to live and to, uh, to earn the guard that you've given us. Lord Father, thank you, Lord Father, for your love. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. And I thank you for all that was shared. We thank you uh, uh, for the day that is to come and for this church and all the blessings. In all these things, Lord Father, we uh, ask for forgiveness of our sins. We pray that you continue to walk with us each and every day. In Jesus' name we give thanks. Amen. Amen. God bless.